So I will hand over to Gordon. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. Um, let me just share my desktop. Um, okay. So, uh, as Sarah said, what well, my task today is really to look at first schoolboy error. I said Ash 2022. Well, that's not until December, so it's not. It's Ash 2021. So apologies, but I'm going to share some data, some thoughts, and highlights from the meeting. Um, so Ash 2021, um, and, and a lot of us missed out in the, the cultural experience that Georgia would offer us normally by physically going to Atlanta. Instead, we did it virtually, but it was nonetheless a full programme meeting. Um, I'm going to look at three uh, areas, really, immunotherapy, frailty, and, and a couple of key other studies. Then to put it in context, there were, you know, there was over 850 abstracts relating to myeloma, and the vast majority of those were related to treatment, whether it be clinical trial design or a lot of real world reviews, single center, the usual stuff. So there's a huge amount of stuff yet again presented in the myeloma arena. And what I'm going to do today is just talk about abstracts that, and data that I think are important, not only for us designing clinical trials, but also it informs the land, the treatment landscape upon which we are going to be overlaying clinical trials. Now, I'm sure that, um, you know, I, I will miss out on key abstracts that uh, it will upset some people. Uh, I'm sure that uh, I will, will not mention abstracts that Chris Parrish will be waiting for me to mention, but the, these are the abstracts that I think are going to be useful, so bear with me. Just as an interlude, uh, or rather as a, an introduction, this cartoon really depicts the treatment landscape of myeloma in the last 50, 60 years, from Melphalan in the late 50s, all the way through to the start of the image, which started with excuse me, thalidomide in 99. And then you see the evolution of the image in red, and then the introduction of PIs in the early noughties with first in class bortezomib, and then we come through to Kerfels and Mibixazimib, and then into the era of immunotherapy, starting with the first uh, viable and useful antibody, elotuzumab, but rapidly moving into daratumab and then latterly acetuximab. And we're into T cell redirection therapy. So this is the landscape as it's evolved. And one thing that this uh, pictorial representation doesn't really give you a feel for is the exponential growth in therapeutics that's happened in the last 20 years compared to the 20, 40 years before that. So there is an acceleration of ideas, new treatments, new treatment combinations and treatment strategies. So firstly, let's talk about T cell redirection. Now tumor cells by and large lose their ability to present tumor specific peptides because of many aspects, but one aspect being that they lose the expression of HLA molecules, so they can't present in a standard immune way. However, they do still express markers that can be either uh, identifying markers of the tumor cell or by virtue of the concentration of said markers actually represent a, a viable target. For example, B cell maturation antigen. And there are two main themed strategies. CAR T cells, the cartoon on the left, where the endogenous T cell receptor represented by purple and gold here it is accompanied by a man-made chimeric receptor that's, uh, that's genetically uh, reconstituted in the T cell, that that chimeric receptor doesn't engage with the, uh, an HLA molecule like the standard TCR, but rather engages with the tumor-specific marker. And that's the fundamentals of CAR T cells. By specific antibodies is, is actually a phrase that's more uh, akin to one company's product but these are T cell engagers. And effectively what they do is they bridge the uh, tumor specific marker with the endogenous TCR, again, bypassing the need for an HLA molecule. So these are the two main concepts of immunotherapy. So when we look at the immunotherapy strategies across myeloma, this cartoon, which is a couple of years out of date, but nonetheless gives you a flavor. There are a number of things that can be done. We've mentioned CAR T cells. 
uh, the bispecific T-cell engagers. You've got ADCs thrown in there, you've got naked antibodies, you've also got what are called immunocytokine deliveries, which are a kind of advanced version of an ADC, give or take some biological differences, but it's in the same kind of class. You can also look at using the innate immune system by having what's called CAR NK cells. And then we've got bispecific antibodies and checkpoint inhibitors. So in terms of CAR T cells, there was a lot of data that was presented at ASH 2020 on cell to cell, which is Janssen's CAR T cell, and Ida cell, which is BMS cell genes CAR T cell. Um, and it showed very impressive depths of responses. But what we weren't seeing because of limited follow up was the durability of response. We know, for example, in leukemia, when you use CAR T cells, that generally they're not curative. But in lymphoma, there is a significant proportion of patients who are cured by a CAR T cell. In myeloma, wasn't looking like there was going to be a curative intent, but we didn't know about the durability of response. And this is Cartitude 1, which was presented by Tom Martin. Um, and this is the longer follow up of the BCMA directed CAR T cell, cell to cells, Janssen's product. The Cartitude stable of studies are, are Janssen's clinical development program here. And this was almost 100 patients. Um, the median age was just around 61, but they did have some patients who were almost uh, at the 80 mark. These were heavily pre-treated, median prior lines of six therapies, although it always makes me amused when you see the range, three to 18. I don't think I could name 18 myeloma therapies. So one has to raise a question about that, but nonetheless, they're heavily pre-treated. Almost half of those patients were actually pentadrug refractory uh, and almost 90% were triple class refractory. So really, really heavily pre-treated. Pre um, and what was interesting here was the median time to first response was really just a month with the best response being noticed in under three months. Uh, and the time to complete response also was under three months. The overall response rate was 97.9% with a VGPR or better rate of 94.8%. That's impressive. But what's even impressive still is the fact that they had a stringent CR rate reported at 80.4%. In this population of patients, that level of response is unprecedented. Now, they've got about two thirds of the patients they had uh, available data for MRD, which again gives us a bit of insight into the depths of responses. And what was interesting in the abstract that, that, that Tom presented uh, Ash in December was they were now reporting sustainable MRD rates at six and 12 months. Uh, and they were seeing MRD sustainability at 44% and 18%. So coming back to what I said at the start, that there is a, a definite tail off in this remarkable depth of response. And there's not, doesn't appear to be a plateauing of that. So curative intent is, is somewhere down the line for CAR T cells and myeloma. Now we were seeing PFS data and 18 month PFS and OS data was 66 and 89, 80.9% respectively. Um, and it's a durability of response, median duration of response, which is akin to PFS, but is not PFS, is, uh, is, is just, you know, just over 20 months, 21.8 months, which is impressive depth of response and durability of response from this early data. There were 21 deaths, 10 of which were due to progressive disease, six were treatment related, and five were due to AEs that occurred unrelated to treatment. Uh, the CR, CRS rate, the cytokine release syndrome, for those not familiar with that, is a kind of pro-inflammatory, immune-mediated uh, toxicity from immunotherapies. It's something that we have seen in allografting for years, but it's become a bit more front and center because of immunotherapies. And the CRS rate it was, was almost everybody gets grade one or two CRS. Um, now, what's interesting with cell to cell is that the median time to onset of that is seven days as opposed to one to two days with either cell. Now, oops, I've kind of got out of sync. I apologize. Uh, we'll come back there. I've got some more slides on another uh, CAR T cell that was presented at ASH later on. And I thought I'd move those slides forward. Apologies. Um, Looking at uh, T-cell engagers, this is Philippe Moreau's uh, presentation on the Majestic 1 trial, 
which is a BCMA directed T cell engager uh, to clistamab, and this is uh, another Janssen product. Um, this is uh, a phase one to open label study. Patients were screened, they needed to have at least three prior lines of therapy. They need to be exposed to PI's image and as anti CD38, but no prior BCMA therapy. And the treatment was a step up dose subcutaneous delivery of this T cell engager, and then they were followed up. And just, oh, so this is what's happened. This is, I do apologize. This is the, 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 the slides I wanted to show you. This is the, another CAR T cell that was presented, just a phase one study uh, presented by my Malincody and colleagues uh, as an oral presentation. And the reason why this was of interest is that the two CAR T cells I've mentioned so far were directed against the one and the same antigen. But this CAR T cell is directed against GPRC5D, and therefore it's a different target which may offer a therapeutic approach for relapse after a BCMA directed strategy, whether it be a CAR, a T cell engager, or an ADC. Small study, medium follow up is, is really low, but nonetheless, I just put this in for, for consideration. There's only 17 patients, heavily pre treated, same age distribution as you saw with CAR to TUDE 1 study. They actually had a higher level of patients with extramedullary disease, but otherwise very similar. They looked at the overall response rate uh, and they saw a 69% response rate and a one in four chance of a CR with half the patients getting MRD negativity from this. So again, potent, but we don't know about durability of response. As far as toxicity is concerned, then you know any grade CRS, very similar to the Silta cell product, 90% plus, but the, the clinically relevant grades, grade three or, or above, was very low, less than 10%. Very similar to the Idacel product in that the median onset was a couple of days rather than a week with Siltacel, but level of ICANS, which is the neurotoxicity mediated by the inflammatory response, was again less than 10%, which is what we see with the others. Uh, and there is a level of, of, of uh, hematological toxicity and infections. So back to my apologies, this is back to Philippe Moreau's presentation, the T-cell engager to clistamab in Majestic 1. And the phase one study was only 40 patients. And this, what he was presenting was the phase two dose uh, expansion part of the study. Um, now, basically an ongoing on treatment is 75 with the main reason why patients stopped treatment with progressive disease, but there was patient withdrawal and physician decision. Uh, part of that for 11 patients and there were nine deaths. Looking at the, 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 the patient cohort, one thing that was interesting, median age is pretty similar to cartitude. However, 14.5% you know, of the patients were over 75. So there is a slightly bigger age tail on this compared to cartitude, which is interesting. The other thing is median prior lines is, is five, pretty similar to cartitude. Um, and what you see is the triple class, penta class refractory patients forms, you know, three quarters and, and one third of the, the group. And pretty much most patients were refractory to prior line. So heavily pre-treated, but slightly older than uh, was seen in the cartitude study. EMD in this study was actually less than 20%. So half what you saw in the GPRC5D CAR T cell study I showed just a second ago. Nonetheless, when you look at this heavily treated population, 58% got a VGPR of better, and one in five were getting a stringent CR. The MRD negativity rate was about one in four, uh, a threshold of 10 to the minus six, and was 16% at 10 to minus, sorry, 10 to minus five, and 16% at 10 to minus six. Um, and certainly for patients who achieved a CR or better, the MRD negativity rate was 41.9%. So effective treatment in this heavily pre-treated population, maybe not quite as deep as with the CAR T cells, that's still open to, to, to understanding. Now, unfortunately, the, you know, the median follow-up here is pretty low. Um, and therefore, what we're seeing here is durability of response with a very large caveat that the median follow-up is only eight months. 
but nonetheless, it does look encouraging and time will tell. Um, I don't think there's really a point in going through the rest of that data, to be honest. Uh, toxicity, and this is specifically about cytokine release syndrome. Then a bit less CRS than uh, what we see with the CAR T cells. CAR T cells, remember, is about 90 plus, 90% plus. Here is 75%. And clinically significant CRS that they grade in this presentation at grade two or more, it's 32, which seems higher. But the CAR T cell studies report grade three or higher, which accounts for the difference in numbers. It usually occurs uh, in two days, a bit like the GPRC 5D uh, CAR T cell. Duration is pretty short, but a lot of patients now get exposed to tocilizumab and steroids earlier than what they did with the early CAR T cell studies. And pictorially, what you see here is grade one is the main level of CRS reported, grade two thereafter, with only one patient having grade three, which is 0.6%, which is acceptable. This is another T cell engager. This is Abby's product, ABB, ABBV383. Um, and I won't labour this, but this is uh, this is a safety profile looking at the CRS rate, and you know all grade of, of CRS is across all doses was actually quite a bit less at only 54% of the full study population, 118 patients, and again the level of grade three is is really low. They three patients with grade three CRS. This is looking at response rates to Abby's T cell engager. And again, this is looking across the, the different uh, disease. So the, the dose escalation phase uh, to the left, the dose escalation and the expansion in the middle. And then just for comparison, taking, you know, looking specifically at the triple class refractory group from that dose expansion. And what you're seeing is overall response rates of 80 to 60% uh, from the dose escalation to the dose escalation and expansion. Um, median follow-up is, is still low, so therefore getting a feel for the durability of response it is yet to come, but nonetheless, early data in concert with the others. Um, this is looking at, you know, PFS in this group of individuals. As I said, median follow-up is low, therefore you get quite skewed Kaplan markers on this, but nonetheless, it looks very similar to what we've seen with the other T-cell engagers. So what I've done is I've pulled this all together. Uh, so I've got a series of slides are tables that are looking at, um, excuse me, six out of the eight T-cell engagers that are under clinical development. Four presented here are BCMA-directed. Uh, Talquetamab is, is, is GPRC5D, like the CAR T-cell Ashoji, and Savostamab, uh, which is Ross's product, is the FCRH5 one. Uh, and this is just to give you an idea. Um, I did a similar table for ASH 2020. And of course, this is updated data and there are bigger numbers along the top, but they're still early clinical trials. Um, what, one thing is of interest to point out here is the mode of administration. Um, three out of the six are IV and three out of the six are subcutaneous. And that's important because subcutaneous delivery is likely to make it more tolerable for the patient with reduced extent and instance of immunotoxicity, such as CRS. Um, pretty similar patient groups, similar age ranges. Again, heavily pretreated, medium prior laser therapy, five or six. Most of these patients were refracted to their last line of therapy. Penta and triple class refractory. EMD wasn't reported in every uh, presentation, which is therefore you've got gaps in the boxes. But what you can see is that the level of EMD across the studies ranges anywhere from 17% to 36%. Cytogenetic high risk uh, is relatively low uh, for what you would expect for this group of individuals. Um, so when you look at response rates, if you take the BCMA, stable of, of T-cell engagers, first of all. Uh, Elranatumab reports just under 70%. Teclistamab, similar in the 60s. Abvi's product, they've got a smaller patient group to look at, so they're reporting, at least in the, the dose escalation phase, a higher overall response rate. But once they get more patients in, their response rates are very similar 
to teclistamab and elronatamabs. When we look at the response rates in the, the GPR C5D setting, which is talquetamab, again, you're seeing roughly about the same response rates, if not slightly higher. Sofostamab in the lower dose was reporting a lower uh, overall response rate, but in the higher dose in the escalation phase, and it starts to come up towards 60%. So I think 60 to 70% overall response rate is, 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 is a reasonable estimate. CR rates, again, in a heavily treated population, by and large, you're seeing a quarter to a third of patients getting uh, a CR and MRD rates, again, quite variable, but it depends on the study design and how they report it. And what we are missing is durability of response, PFS, and no surprisingly OS in that regard, because it's a bit too early. Toxicity, CRS, any grade, pretty similar across the board. Um, Regeneron's product was reporting under 40%, which is a bit of a surprise, but you know, we'll see if that comes out when they actually go through their full dose expansion cohort, but, but pretty, pretty much is they're, they're, they're they're very similar across the board. And more importantly, there isn't any obvious difference between the BCMA directed and the GPs, GPRC5D and the FCR H5 uh, uh, agents. Median onset is largely one or two days. Uh, the Regeneron product, they reported it pretty quickly in under 12 hours, uh, which is, is impressive as well, right? There's a lot of tocilizumab and steroid usage here. ICANS, bottom line is ICANS generally is under 10% any grade, and certainly clinically significant is, is much lower than that, if at all. And there is heme toxicity to note. And one of the things that's emerging from a lot of this data is the infection rate uh, is, is surprisingly higher than one would expect, and certainly higher than what we've been seeing with the data that's been coming through on CAR T cells. Um, there is obviously a lot of interest in companies developing combinational studies, um, and I tried to garnish as much information for you from those studies. Um, this is uh, teclistamab coupled up with daratumumab, and, and then there's three uh, dose and delivery modifications. So you can see that there's very limited patient numbers, 19, 4, and 10 across that. And therefore, you've got to be fairly... Um, uh, cynical about reporting overall response rates in such low, I mean, 100% response rate, well, four out of four people got a good response. So that's what I mean by being very cautious about over-interpreting. Uh, Toquetumab and daratumumab, again, across three dose uh, and dose delivery um, uh, cohorts, but it's low patient numbers, five, seven, and nine. And again, we're seeing uh, pretty inflated overall response rates I'm not being cynical about the response rates, but we need more patients to make comment properly about it. Um, this is just looking at those two uh, dose escalation early phase studies, just looking at toxicity. And the CRS rate is probably about the same as teclistamab and toquetamab on their own. So the daratumab is not making that any more uh, obvious, nor is it increasing the risk of ICANs. Uh, heme toxicity is still the same. And again, this not worrying, but slightly concerning infection rate that we need to be mindful of. It's in a small number of patients, but nonetheless, we need to keep a close eye on that going forward. There's a number of other studies that are out there uh, in combination, and I just list this again because it gives you a feel for the evolving clinical trial landscape. So you look to clistamab, and daratumumab is a randomization versus a daratumumab-based uh, non-T-cell engagement combo, such as DPD, DVD. There's teclistamab and talquetamab with or without daratumumab. That's going to be a tasty trial to be looking at. Uh, teclistamab, daratumumab, plus pom personalized pomalinamide, and then teclistamab, oh, but you can read this for yourself. Um, the gamma secretase inhibitor, uh, narragasset, it is something worthy of, of watching out for the results when they come through in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is just for completeness. 
showing you uh, our anatomabs uh, combinational uh, study going, studies going forward. Um, so some of us are already engaged with uh, magnetism five, which is our anatomab plus or minus DARA versus DPD. Uh, but then there's ranatinab in the gamma secretase inhibitor, and then there's ranatinab plus steroids, Revmid or pomalinamide coming through. Um, talquetamabs combination studies, yeah, it, it's, it's the same as the as the, as the talquetamab, uh, teclistamab rather. Uh, pretty much, you just basically take out teclistamab in the previous slide and stick in talquetamab. So it's the same sort of idea. Uh, Roche's zavostamab study. At the moment, it is very much on monotherapy, but I know they have plans to go into combinational work. So that was all I was going to say about immunotherapy. Um, as I said, there was a very interesting abstract there on Modata Fusk, which is uh, Takeda's uh, smart immunocytokine, uh, which is basically front end CD38 directed, conjugated to a modified interferon alpha. And that is showing some very interesting biological effects and some early clinical effects in an advanced population but i didn't have time to make some slides for that so moving on to um frailty side of things there was a number of, of frailty abstracts 19 in total that were largely looking at treatment um so there's a hover 143 study which i'm going to show you some data from there's ifm study which is exazomib and daratumab uh, in a steroid free frailty uh, driven study. Um, there's also some real world data capture looking at uh, the, the, the impact of the IMWG frailty score, uh, looking at health nurse related quality of life profiles. Um, there was the Cartitude 5, which was a VRD followed by cell to cell, the, the, the BCMA directed CAR T cell. Uh, and that did include some older patients, but of the more fitter group rather than the frail group. And then there's a very interesting uh, abstract, abstract 1671 from Australian colleagues who were looking at using it's a toxamab rescue from an inadequate response to lenalidomide in a frailer population. And this is where I get to, to plug our own work. Um, we submitted an abstract uh, to the trials and, and progress, uh, largely written by Charlotte Holland. Uh, and I'm pleased to say because it was written very well, but Charlotte and Cara had put a, a lot of effort into to generating uh, the, the abstract, as did Amy in terms of uh, generating data. Uh, and this was accepted for an oral presentation. Uh, I'm just going to go through this very briefly because I know the, a lot of you were at the symposium on Friday afternoon, so you've seen the actual presentation. For those who are not familiar with the trial, this is looking to take the IMWG frailty score, which is a known and proven prognostic biomarker, and test whether it's a predictive biomarker, that is, whether it can be used to direct treatment going forward. A lot of people are assuming it is, and therefore are designing and, and delivering trials on that basis, but nobody's actually proven it yet. So what we are doing is we are taking a uh, patient population, everybody gets frailty scored, but then randomizing the one-to-one -one basis between a standard delivery of treatment, which is a standard dose, and then adjusted in accordance with the emergence of toxicity, the reactive arm, versus the proactively adjusted arm, which is frailty adjustments based on the scaled dose delivery modifications you can see there in the color coding, green fit, amber, unfit and red frail. Then after 12 cycles, all patients are then brought together for a second randomization, which is a placebo controlled maintenance randomization. The primary objective is looking at early treatment cessation for R1 and PFS for R2. Secondary objectives are listed there. We have a number of exploratory endpoints, including laboratory uh, biomarker discovery uh, using things like immunosenescence, immune metabolic parameters, uh, and also body composition uh, determinations through imaging. Interim analysis is planned when we have 50% of participants uh, through 60 days after R1. This is the recruitment as we presented at ASH, which is the recruitment uh, from the data cutoff in October 21. 
Uh, we are now at 360, I think, who have gone through R1 uh, and R2, I think, 24 as of the, this month. So the trial is proceeding very, very well, despite the influence of COVID on the delivery of clinical research. And it's a, it's a big thank you to everybody involved in the centres, but especially in CTIU, who were able to open this study between wave one and wave two of COVID in 2020, which is no mean feat uh, and big applause to them. Um, one thing I've been a data, it was interesting to actually get an old abstract based on no data. Uh, it's a first for me, so I, I did enjoy myself at this point. But anyway, this is probably about the only real data uh, that, that, uh, that we could present. Um, but this shows the, the trial distribution. So one concern when Graeme Jackson and I designed this trial was that, you know, we might not get frail patients in because traditionally such patients aren't candidates for clinical trials, either patient decisions or the clinician looking after them. But I'm pleased to say that over 40% of the patients in the 266 that are presented at ASH were classified IMWG frail. We're also prospectively testing the uh, MRP that David Carr and I uh, generated, published in Lancet Hematology. It's been proven in uh, real life uh, data sets, but we're now testing it prospectively in this data set. Uh, and we can see a nice spread across the three risk groups with a third of the patients being MRP high risk. And what the graph on the right shows you is the distribution between MRP and the IMWG frailty because they are not synonymous. They do overlap, as you can see from this, but there are differences. And the MRPs are more of a vulnerability score rather than a frailty score because it has no functionality in the, the assessment. Anyway, so that was what we presented on behalf of the UK. This is the Hovon 143 study, uh, which is Sonia Zwiegman's uh, uh, study looking at Xazima, Dara, Dex, uh, an intermediate fit. So this is the unfit population, the amber ones in mile number 14, if you will. Um, and this is a study schedule. We have nine cycles, each cycle being four weeks, and it's exazomib standard dose, daratumab standard dose, and a reduced dose of dexamethasone by comparison. And then after nine cycles, we go on to eight weekly cycles of, of uh, a maintenance strategy which is exazomib, daratumab, and a low dose of dexamethasone. Um, it's a population that median age is 76, but older than 75 is, is over half the patients, so 57% are over that, that age. And almost a third of patients have two or more Charleston comorbidity index points. Their ID, IADLs uh, were less than five in 14%. So, this patient population is truly representative of the IMWG unfit population. Um, the best response to induction, overall response rate was 71%, low level of CR rate with this regimen, but you know, just about one in three were getting a VGPR or better, it's slightly more than a one in three. Um, and that, that's pretty reasonable for the delivery of a dose modified strategy up front. Um, median follow-up was a year and a half, which is pretty good, and therefore they were able to assess the median PFS, which came in at 17.4 months. Um, there was a, an alteration in the PFS in accordance with age. Uh, the older patients were having slightly reduced PFSs, and there was an alteration in accordance with the comorbidity in the IADL. In terms of overall survival, well, these are frontline patients. These are relatively early follow-up to be able to determine OS. So not surprisingly, that doesn't really show you very much, uh, that graph on the right-hand side. Relapse rate was pretty low, but again, follow-up slow, so that's not really surprising. Non-relapse mortality uh, was 8%, uh, two sudden deaths, two unknown, and one died of a mesothelioma. And this is, this is of interest because one of the things that we are starting to report in this population of patients is not just a PFS, but an event-free survival. Um, and this was, it was largely driven by Alessandro LaRocca in the EMN-related studies. And I think it does actually hold water for this population of patients. 
And what you see from the pie chart is, is the looking at these events and non-hematological adverse events, grades three and four, that caused issues within the study is by far the largest share of the pie. 59% of the events noted in this were related to non-hematox. Progressive disease, one in three, and then treatment discontinuations, hematox, and death accounted for four, four and two percent respectively. Reasons for not proceeding to maintenance um, are, are listed here. Progressive disease was probably the commonest at uh, 19 patients. Toxicity in compliance, which I'm not sure is an actual word, but anyway, um, and, and sudden death. So, you know, discontinuation of exazomib alone was relatively low in this population. Uh, but they were, remember, they were the amber group. This is not the red group. So these are the relatively fit, i.e. not frail patients. Other studies, just to, to finish off, um, yeah, time's running ahead of us. Um, this is uh, Cassiopeia. Um, now, the, the slides that I've got, I got from Hervé, because Hervé provided the Cassiopeia MRD assessment. It was an oral presentation. I couldn't get the slides in time to look at the, um, the second part of Cassiopeia, but I'll, I'll explain that as we go through this. So basically, this is Cassiopeia. It's in transplant eligible patients, frontline, uh, and therefore patients are randomized to DARA VTD versus VTD. You have a transplant, then you have post transplant consolidation with the same as a reduction, so DARA VTD versus VTD. And then as a maintenance bit, we'll come back to that. So, what everybody was presenting at ASH was the MRD uh, response from the study. So, this is CR or better, and MRD negative rates, regardless of that second, that part two of Cassiopeia, as we showed at the end. Um, and what you see in purple is DARA VTD versus VTD in orange, and there is a significant uplift in MRD negative rates. Post-induction, it's just under 10% with DARA VTD. Post-transplant consolidation, it's 33.7%. Now, that seems quite low. Um, and particularly since this is by multi-parameter flow cytometry to 10 to the minus 5. I mean, we would see 40% plus post-transplant in the length of myeloma living. But nonetheless, it is the trials, the reports, and, you know, this is what they, they show. And one of the things that's of interest in this is that irrespective of what your part 2 was, your sustainable MRD negativity at 1 in 2 years was reported and was significantly better if you had DARA VTD induction consolidation than having VTD induction consolidation. And this is the um, uh, you know, PFS curves looking at the, the one-year landmark analysis on the left, two-year landmark analysis on the right. And really what you see is the top purple line is patients who were given DARA VTD induction consolidation who gained MRD negative CR do better than everybody else uh, in this context. Be careful with this though, because this is a subgroup, pre-planned subgroup analysis based on disease response, when in actual fact, the trial itself was based around determining depth of response and durability as standardly. So this is a window of observation on the trial rather than the trial data, because Cassiopeia's response and durability response from part one was presented at ASH 2020, okay? Now, this is where it gets all quite complicated because part two is the maintenance, which is DARA to map monotherapy versus observation. And there was lots of criticism about this because observations is not alone is not a standard of care. When this study was designed and implemented, Revermed was the standard of care. Even in the UK, we have Revermed as standard of care. So therefore, DARA mono versus nothing it, it is of questionable clinical significance. Um, and again, this is part of Hervé's uh, study, the MRD components. And what I'd like to show you here is down the left is the, the way that people were divvied up by the end of the part two. You had data VTD induction consolidation and then data maintenance. You had data VTD, then observation. Then you had VTD, people who got data maintenance, 
and in VTD who got observation. And the bottom line is, and it's not shown here, this is the MRD negativity rate in orange is the 10 to the minus five and blue is 10 to the minus six. What I'm not showing you here because I, I, I couldn't get the slide in time was the PFS overall on the study. Now, BTD and observation does the least well out of that, but everything above that is a bit of a mess. Um, and this slide here pays a bit of homage to that. When we look at the MRD rate, whether you get data before the transplant, after the transplant, or together, the bottom line is it's not really different, the MRD rate, okay? Looks like 53 to 64 is different, but it's not significantly different in that regard. So when we look at the PFS, it actually at the moment looks like it doesn't matter whether you get data before the transplant or after the transplant, you do better than somebody not getting data at all. And that's a bit of a problem from the trial design, the trial delivery, but also it's a bit of a problem in how we interpret that. So why am I showing you this? Well, the reason why I'm showing you this is because on the basis of Cassiopeia part one, those colleagues in Scotland were given permission to access data VTD pre-transplants and post-transplant consolidation early last year. And then in England, we got the permission to use that on the Cancer Drugs Fund by the end of the year. So for people designing trials going forward, both in terms of frontline trials, but also in particular first relapse or in the Raptor fractory, you've got to be mindful that people will be data exposed, but probably not necessarily data refractory. And therefore that needs to be brought into their thinking going forward. Um, just a couple of uh, other abstracts that were of interest in the biomarker group. Um, there was a couple of abstracts. One looked at peripheral blood monocyte counts um, and looked at this in the prospect of a risk stratification model. There was some single cell RNA-seq identifying biomarker patterns that would predict the response to immunotherapy in high-risk smoldering myeloma, which was actually quite an interesting uh, abstract when it was presented. Um, there was also an abstract which I have to say that I'm sure I've seen this before back in the 1990s, but I couldn't go find it but it's the prognostic impact of the T-cell count in apheresis collection in autologous stem cell transplant. I'm sure this has been done. My group, when I was in Glasgow, we certainly looked at the prognostic impact of pro-monocytes and monocytes in the apheresis collection. I looked at my publication, we didn't comment on the T-cells, but I'm sure somebody else has. But anyway, that was represented or presented for the first time in, uh, in ISO 2021. And then there was some deep profiling of the immune microenvironment throughout the myeloma disease stages, which again was giving some insight into biomarker development. But there were 39 biomarker abstracts in the, 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 uh, in the presentations. And this is looking at the absolute monocyte count. And, and it's not just, it basically, is, if you've got a low uh, monocyte count, which is red, uh, and you have an elevated one, you actually, both of those groups seem to do less well than you've got a normal one. So that's the red is, is low, green is elevated compared to orange is normal. So you can see, you know, changes in survival probability there going forward. Um, and then you looked at, that was a diagnosis, and then you looked at two and a half years uh, from diagnosis, and it seemed to be more obvious uh, that that was the case. So green is an elevated monocyte count, Red is a low one compared to a normal monocyte count in orange. Now, does this pay homage to changes in the innate immune system in relation to the disease? Possibly. In relation to disease control? Possibly. Or the, the one at two and a half years in particular, is that looking at changes in the monocyte count in relation to delivered treatment? Difficult to know, <clears throat> but it's all part of the possible explanation for this. So it's definitely of interest. Um, oh, this is a T-cell, you don't want to see this, we'll skip over it. So, um, as I said, there are a lot of abstracts as there is year on year, uh, and there's no sign of a reduction in clinical or translational research in myeloma being presented at ASH. It's always a feast of too many things, and it's difficult to see sometimes the wood from the trees. What I've given you a flavour of this afternoon are abstracts and aggregated abstract data that I think 
are important for the clinical trial landscape going forward. Uh, but apologies if I've offended anybody by not including their favorite bestest abstract from 2021. Uh, we've all got our personal favorites uh, going forward, but happy to take any questions and thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Gordon. That was really interesting. Really um, appreciate pulling all of that information together. There certainly is a lot there for us to, to digest and, and to work through. So, um, so I'll start by opening up to the floor. Any questions? I, Holly, I don't know if you can see hands. I'm not very good at spotting hands raised. Or if there's any questions, please do put them in the chat. Maybe I could start off with a question then. So, um. You presented a lot of the studies on the T cell engagers of the phase ones and twos, and then a, a couple of the combination studies in, in phase three. Um, what, what's next for us in the UK? What, what studies have we got that are, are looking at the, the T cell engagers? So it, it's, it's a, the reason why I spent more time on that is because that at the moment is the, the relatively hot topic. And you're right, Sarah, what we're seeing at ASH, we're seeing in the early phase trials from the study from the companies to push their, their, their products forward and I'm sure there are many people on the call who've also seen the clinical development programs from most of these companies so we see where they're going and that particularly includes combinations but also moving the products further and further up the pathway and being mindful of that then we obviously want to be bringing t-cell engagers into our design of studies now, we do have two studies in the CARP program. Uh, one that is funded and supported by Janssen's, which is Impactal, well, it's called Impactal, it's now called Impact, I, I see, uh, which is looking at early relapse patients and, and treating them with, uh, uh, no, is it Tarquetamab, isn't it? It's Tarquetamab, right? Um, uh, which is the, uh, the non BCMA, so it's the, the GPRC 5D. And that's good because that gets us a foot in the door of, of immunotherapy studies. Bitten, which is the post-transplant MRD positive arena, uh, is a, a T-cell engager based study. But we've had some problems with uh, uh, pharmaceutical partner engagement. And uh, the most recent uh, variation on that study design was going to be including teclizumab, but that is now being pulled. So we're back to looking at alternative partners. Um, Going forward, we have myeloma 16, which is the follow on study for myeloma 12, the salvage transplant and first relapse. And there's a study design that's going to have a T cell engager in it. And we have got reasonably advanced pharmaceutical partner engagement with that. The study design will probably change as we evolve that partnership. But at the moment, it's looking to be a T cell engager, Dara 2 map. Uh, as an induction question against our tumor car carfilzum of debt. And then we're going to say a T cell engager consolidation, phase consolidation, will displace the need for a salvage transplant. So that's, that's another one. And now starting because of myeloma 14, fitness studies recruiting on schedule, if not slightly ahead, I now need to start putting plans together for what will be myeloma 18. If myeloma 17 is a follow-on from radar that, that Matt Jenner and Martin Kaiser are, are, are working on designing, the myeloma 18 will be the next frail study. Um, and already I've been having some thoughts about that, which will include a CAR T cell, it will include a T cell engager, and hopefully include a bit of a novel design to, to deal with biological accelerated aging. So there's, there's going to be hopefully lots in that. So that's that's the point of it, spending so much time on the T cell engagers because they're going to be a backbone. And the, the problem with CAR T cells is accessing CAR T cells. It's, it can be quite tricky to get a production slot and get your patient on it. T cell engagers are off the shelf. At the moment, CAR T cells look to be more potent, at least in terms of depth of response. But we don't know whether there's any difference in, in durability response between T cell engagers and CAR T cells. And that will come out. I suspect as we go on, as we reinvent the wheel with CAR T cells, we're going to get bigger and better and more robust and may even approach the lymphoma curative intent. We'll wait and see. But what we've got just now to play with uh, is very, very interesting. 
What I didn't show was data on the third party or the allogeneic CAR T cell study that they was showing, the original data was shown in 2020 and then an update of the data was shown in 21. And that's going to be very interesting because that will overcome one of the major issues, which is access to production and it will be off the shelf CAR T cell. So there is a lot of stuff happening in that space. That's really great to hear that there's, there is so much coming to the UK in, in that space. You know, I, I think sometimes we see these things uh, presented at ASH, the very early early phase studies and, and see that, you know, the American market and the European market getting access. So it's really great to see that that coming to yeah. the UK. I mean, to be honest, it is a challenge. Um, and one of the main reasons why companies go to the US centres for their first and man early phase ones is largely driven by attorneys. Um, because of not wanting to go out of a single jurisdiction and blah, blah, blah. Well, we've got to be honest with ourselves. We are never going to be able to influence that. But what we have been doing with the UKMRA over the last few years is trying very hard to get into the early phase, get into the 1Bs and the 2As, get in that stage. And that allows us to get a foot in the door. And we're seeing some early signs of, of success in that because of how the MRA works as a collegiate collaborative grouping and we've got a lot of talented people within that group uh, and, and therefore that's, that, that sells itself really to pharmaceutical partners. Yeah and ultimately is one of the, the main aims of the, the CART program really is to be able to bring in those novel agents into the, the innovative platform designs. You mentioned impact before and, and the platform approach that's being taken in there so it's great to see as a UK collaborative that, that we are now demonstrating we can bring these agents forward and efficiently. And it, it does because it, it, we were, our discussions with pharmaceutical partners, we can offer the CAP platform with its novelty in trial design and trial delivery. And that's definitely a feather in our CAP in those negotiations. Um, so we just need to come good and deliver some really groovy, sexy trials, don't we? Absolutely. Okay, so I can't see any other hands up and I don't think there's anything in there in the chat. Um, so we've got three minutes left. So very, very quick question then, Gordon. The fitness um, trial, the frailty testing, that um, the way that that frailty test is delivered, how how long does it take to, to, to do that test in practice in clinic? I'm just intrigued as to how, you know, if, <laughs> if it's rolled out, I, I have no concept of that. Um, what can you can answer in two minutes. <laughs> um, if you're experienced at doing it, it still takes you about 20, 25 minutes. Right, okay. Um, in fact, that was one of the drivers for David, Carr and I to develop the MRP, was because we wanted it to be something that was more objective and more easy to do, shall we say. Yeah. Um, but it's the actual functionality part of the, the frailty score that takes the time. And it's the functionality part that makes a frailty score. And we don't have that in MRP we've got standard performance scores. So, you know, to get a frailty score, you've got to invest in the time. Full geriatric assessment, which is much more labor intensive than the IMWG frailty score, will take you a lot longer, but yeah. it does take you a little while to, to do it. Now, from a point of view of doing clinical studies, there is the modified IMWG frailty score, which is taking out the ADL and IDL and replacing that with performance status, which is what we've got in the MRP. So the, I think the modified IMWG frailty score isn't any better than the MRP. Okay. In fact, the MRP is, is probably better in that regard. Yeah. But, that's, but that was done for convenience to retrospectively subgroup patients from the pharma trials rather than prospectively going forward. Thanks, Gordon. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Gordon, again, and um, for myself and, and on behalf of everyone for a really interesting, informative talk. Really appreciated that. Thank you everyone for joining us again today. Holly has just very kindly um, displayed the details of our next webinar coming up in March. As I mentioned, Martin Kaiser will be talking to us about the MUC9 uh, optimum results that were also presented at ASH um, in, in December. So please do um, have another look at the, uh, the schedule of events and I hope to see you, uh, some of you in the future at, at future webinars. So thanks very much everyone, have a great day. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Bye.